San Diego State announced that they are leaving the Mountain West, or at least that they intend to. But when does that mean they're joining the Pac-12? Yes, somehow, eh, we still don't know. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked on Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights free, still, and beloved, still, Conference of Champions. Like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch the show, which today is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked on. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked on today to get started. We've got some academic stuff to talk about a a little bit later because that ties into finances and athletics with universities because this is a Pac-12 show. So we can't go a single day really without talking about the fact that we don't have a media deal yet. We don't know when it's going to show up. And then academics are a part of all of this realignment talk and then uh, some Stanford discussion later as well because they're making a couple notable moves. But the big news over the weekend, San Diego State announced that they intend to resign from the Mountain West Conference. Pete Thamel first broke the news. ESPN reporter said sources, San Diego State gave the Mountain West written notice this week that the school intends to resign from the Mountain West Conference. SDSU asked the Mountain West West for, quote, a one-month extension given unforeseen delays involving other collegiate athletic conferences beyond our control, end quote. Translation. They're waiting for the Pac-12 to finish up its media rights deal. And there are circumstances that they are describing in that particular statement as unforeseen that are continuing to delay this stuff. So is this a step forward in the right direction towards solidifying the conference, finalizing the deal, ending the process that we have all waited so, so long to have come to an end? Yes, absolutely, it is. This is something we've been waiting for. We've talked about the June 30th deadline here for San Diego State, and this is a tangible, this is not, you know, read between the lines on this particular statement or that one over there, though we're doing it a little bit on this one, but this is a step that the university took that has been reported, and we know that this is a solid thing that is going to happen. Now, what we are left to continue speculating about is what the holdup is. And I, I have I have long said, everydayers here at the show, whether you listen or watch every day, I appreciate you, number one. Number two, you know that I have long been curious and will continue to be curious about what specifically the holdup is. And everybody wants to jump to, well, they don't have any money that, you know, they're they're getting from the uh, from the media rights partners. They don't have a contract. They don't have a deal. They, it's all this sort of stuff. That continues to be an unknown at best. Because here is San Diego State, who've openly stated their desire to be in the Pac-12, who are now going to leave the Mountain West, or at least have stated that it is their intention to do so, so that they can join another conference starting in 2024, as in next year, you know, once USC and UCLA are gone, meaning what I have long predicted and hope will come to pass will one day come to pass, which is San Diego State is one of the expansion teams, SMU also looking like a likely target there for the Pac-12, and those would be your top two. But we still don't know when, because this timeline, for various reasons, right? Now, I, I'm, I'm curious as to the language of the statement here. Unforeseen delays involving other collegiate athletic conferences beyond our control. Now, that could very well be that the Pac-12 as a conference is in disarray, that they're not getting it together, that they're botching this, that they're messing up the process, or, and this is something else that, is, that, is, that has been thrown out before by, by, by reputable media people, and I, I tend to believe this, doesn't mean I know that it's true, I'm just saying I think this is pretty likely. There are some sort, there, there are a variety probably of holdups, of details, of arrangements, of 
rights of games, allotments, and everything with regards to figuring out this media rights deal, which is not an extension of a previous deal like it was with the Big 12. It is a brand new contract. There have to be a variety of factors that we are not privy to, only the people having these conversations to, that are complicating this deal, that are taking it longer than even some of the presidents thought to finish. Now, maybe that's a dollar figure. Maybe that's figuring out which partners you're actually going to go with. I think all of that has been a part of it to this point. But right now, if you know who you want to add, you know the schools would say yes, and you know that that's something that presidents are probably going to be on board with for a variety of reasons, then the holdup to me, I think it is likely, again, not reporting anything here, I'm speculating, but that's kind of how the show works, that there are details with regards to who gets the best games, who gets this number of games, because there's not going to be just one media rights partner, and that there are complicating factors because you are dealing with a media entity, be it Apple, Amazon, or whoever, that has not been in the college sports broadcast broadcasting space before. That's just a theory. It is mine, and I don't know exactly what those factors are. But this is still a big, big piece of news because San Diego State openly saying, we are leaving the Mountain West. Yeah, that's a big step because we all know where they want to go. They have said publicly, yeah, we want to go to the Pac-12. We don't want to go to the Big 12. And I've talked about here on the show before that based on what I've heard from people who cover the Big 12, their interest in San Diego State is not particularly high at this point in time. Leaving the Pac-12 is the only option for San Diego State to go Power 5, which they're ready to do. And look, the Big 12 is trying to add you know, Power 5 schools. They, they want this whole thing to fizzle out so that Arizona and Colorado would come over to the Big 12. But this would be a tangible step in the direction towards that not happening. And it appears they, they are not interested in adding another G5 school, which I also understand, right? Because in the opening uh, stages, in the first few years of a G5 school joining a Power 5 conference, they are not an accretive product to the television media deal. They become that over time if they do things the right way, like we always talk about, Utah and TCU in the, the Pac-12 and Big 12, respectively, and there are other examples as well. But they don't appear, and I think it does make some sense at some level, given that they're adding four G5 schools in BYU, Cincinnati, Houston, and UCF, that they wouldn't want to necessarily add another one, even though it is in a time zone that they have openly stated, the Big 12, that they'd like to get into. And again, I think that's pretty smart from Brett Yormark. If you're not on the offensive, you are on the defensive. And that is not a place to be in conference realignment, and you got to play your hand as, as best you can on that front. So the timeline here for San Diego State do, does indicate that the Pac-12 media deal is not imminent. That, that, that is what is abundantly clear here. They are asking for that extension because the media deal is not days away. And I long ago stopped waking up every morning thinking, is this the day? Is this the day? Is this the day? Is this the day? Did that for a while. I moved on from that literally months ago because they all thought, you know, given that the, the, the comments that were made from presidents and athletic directors, like, oh, yeah, end of March or so to be this, that. And then they pushed it out to end of May, early June. And at that point, I threw my hands up and said, OK, I'm done. I'm done trying to predict the timeline here. But this is an indication here that it's not going to be done by June 30th. Is that a bad thing for the Pac-12? It's a thing for the Pac-12. And we will talk about that. But first, we have to talk about FanDuel because FanDuel Sportsbook is America's number one sportsbook. Baseball season is in full swing, and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to join today. Don't miss your chance to snag that no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. You can bet college football games. There are already lines to bet we are that close we're in the middle of june we're in the middle of june we are getting ever closer to the start of college football you can bet over under win totals conference champions whatever you want it's all there fandle also an official partner of major league baseball and that is where you need to go for all of your gambling action
All right. It was a badly needed second segment sip. I had a uh, exciting, awesome, amazing, but also kind of exhausting uh, boys trip weekend uh, that was surrounded around some pretty amazing golf. So that's why the show's coming out later today for you everydayers out there. Uh, was just, I got back late last night, exhausted, was not going to be able to give you a good show. And I want to give you the best product possible. That's why we have the second segment sip. But we've had it, we're refurbished, we're ready to go. So, the timeline here for the Pac-12. Originally was looking like June 30th, but San Diego State is asking for an extension here from the Mountain West because they have probably been told by the Pac-12, yeah, we're not going to have this deal done for, again, whatever reason we can speculate from now until the end of time as to what that is. Well, until the deal comes out and then we maybe get some... uh, looking back reporting on, yeah, this is what took so long. Yeah, this was the sticking point. Yeah, this was tricky. Yeah, this took, you know, and, and all that sort of stuff. So they're asking you for an extension from the Mountain West. Now, my first reaction to that was, why would you do that if you're the Mountain West? San Diego said, do you want one of your biggest brands in both football and men's basketball that just played in the national championship game? Do you want that team? Do you want a Southern California school? You're only one. Do you want them leaving your conference? No. However, there is then kind of another side to this. So from what I've been able to uh, to surmise and you know reading reports and stories about all this sort of stuff, San Diego State is trying to get an extension on that June 30th deadline, which was when they had to leave the conference by or inform the conference that they would be leaving by in order to join in 2024 without the exit fee doubling from $17 million to $34 million. So, again, I, my, that's why my initial reaction, if I were the Mountain West, would be, uh, no, the Pac-12 is taking long to get their media deal together. That's a you problem. That's not a me problem. That's a you problem. So, we would like that $34 million if you can't figure it out by then. But the other thing, too, is if San Diego State leaving is inevitable then you may want to make the best of the situation as you know as it presents itself if you're the Mountain West. So one thing that I've seen is, or a suggestion that I have seen, and I think makes a lot of sense, is the exit fee not doubling to $34 million, but maybe being a few million dollars more, right? And so instead of it being $17 million that you get necessarily all at once, they could pay it over the course of uh, several years, which, by the way, is how the American conference schools are doing it. The ones who joined the Big 12, Cincinnati, Houston, and UCF, they all owe the American conference $18 million per leaving. But they are paying that $18 million over the course of 11 years. So San Diego State could theoretically set up the same sort of thing here and kind of lessen the financial blow, right? It can be kind of a win for both sides. San Diego State could allow the Pac-12 to, you know, operate on on its own timeline here and continue to work out the details of, of the media rights contract and then, you know, eventually join and such and join for 2024. And the Mountain West could get a little bit more than they would have if San Diego State left before June 30th, in which it would be just $17 million. And I think San Diego State might also have some kind of athletic goodwill from the Mountain West right now because they just got to the national championship game and every game that a team from a particular conference plays in the NCAA tournament, it's worth what's called a unit. And a unit if you, you know, continue as you continue to progress, that money goes to the conference every game that's played and then gets distributed to the schools. So bottom line, and I, I've seen varying reports about, you know, how much a unit is really worth. But basically, San Diego State, by going to the national championship game in men's basketball, just made the Mountain West many millions of dollars. And my understanding is that that may very well, and logically so, factor into the discussions with the Mountain West for negotiating their exit or their departure here. And I think if you're the Mountain West, again, if this, if San Diego State leaving is inevitable and they just did something great for your conference, which has made everybody a lot of money, including the conference, by, by the way, also bolstered its reputation and everything like that, like that was a huge, huge deal if you're the commissioner in the Mountain West. Given that that is all kind of tying together, I think negotiating a slightly higher exit fee that, you know, maybe gets paid out over the course of time 
but isn't quite doubling to 34 million, there could be some goodwill in there. I'm not privy to what the dynamic is between San Diego State and the Mountain West Conference at this point in time, but that is something that I could definitely foresee playing out, and it'll be interesting to follow all this sort of stuff. But bringing this back to the Pac-12 and their timeline here, it looks like we're going to go into July. Like, that's the only reason San Diego State would ask for this extension, right? You're not going to, you know, open yourself up to the possibility for San Diego State of paying any million or any, you know, $5 even more than you have to to leave this conference unless you know for sure that there's a very real possibility or a, a, a set fact like you, it's a certainty that you are not going to have a conference with a completed media rights deal to join by June 30th. I don't think they ask for this to kind of cover their bases and say, ah, you know, in, in case the Pac-12 doesn't get their media rights, that and in case it extends into July and such, we want to have this as an option. I think you only come out and say, hey, Mountain West, we need this extension if you know for certain this Pac-12 stuff is not going to be wrapped up anytime soon. So, I think that's everything I've got on that. As always, send me your questions, whether it's a YouTube comment or at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore Pac-12 on, on Twitter. Questions about San Diego State, SMU, Pac-12, anything that, that you want. We'll always answer it here, here on the show. But those are, th those are my thoughts on San Diego State and the timeline here and why, again, much like when I saw the you know Pac-12, uh, what was it, Washington State, uh, agenda item and it said you know we need to vote to give authority to Kirk Schultz to do something with regards to executing uh, the the grant of rights and the media future of Washington State yada 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 I looked at that and you know, there were some people in Pac-12 circles who were maybe thinking oh boy this is finally the moment and my takeaway was let's let's be patient here and here we are we're being patient we still don't have a deal yet, and this is a step, right? It is it is a step. These are much more clear indicators than presidents and athletic directors doing interviews saying, yeah, we're in the final stages of the media deal. Yeah, it'll be done soon. These are much more clear, tangible steps towards reaching the, the finalization of all this sort of stuff, but we are still not at the point where a deal appears to be imminent within the next couple of days. Now, before the college football season starts, yes, of course, but... Did I expect to be here at this point? Nope. But here we are. And that's what we should continue to expect going forward. Don't get your hopes up about, you know, oh, this means the deal is three days away. No, it's not. We could be going into July. I'm just going to wake up every day and react to the news as it comes out. All right. Let's get to one of those mailbag questions, by the way, from Aaron. Spencer, can you explain this academic funds thing? I don't get it. I always understood this to be the level of funded research generated by an individual school, but you make it sound as though there's some shared fund all member schools are drawing from, and that just doesn't make sense. Where does the money come from, and why would whoever sources uh, just give it to schools who are on the take? It also seems like a Pac-12 academic funding arrangement has not been an issue with any current school's interest towards the Big Ten, hoping you can sort out the confusion. Yeah, so I talk about this on the show, not because I necessarily care about it, but because it is factoring into the decisions that these presidents make. And the reason that this ties into athletics is people love to, you know, make the statement, oh, they're going to go to the Big 12, or they're going to go to, you know, this conference or whatever, mostly with regards to the Big 12 is where this comes into play. Because the Big 10 is, you know, a big, they have a lot of big, big time research schools over there. There's a lot more research money available in, in, in the Big Ten. And I'll explain all that in, in just a sec. But the reason this ties into a show where I'm talking primarily about college football and college basketball is that with regards to conference affiliation, this stuff matters to university presidents, who we all know, as it'll go on my gravestone one day, presidents drive realignment. Not athletic directors, not coaches, not players, not fans university presidents. And so the reason that I bring this up all the time is because when people say, well, if the Pac-12 media deals $4 million less than, you know, the Big 12 on a per school payout, you have to go over to the Big 12. No, you don't. There are a lot of reasons as to why that's the case. But one of them is most definitely that the amount of money a university president is responsible for as the operating budget of the university Three to four million dollars is not making a dent. It is not even particularly close. 
Now, that does not mean that a gap in media rights revenue could never drive a school to go over here, over there, because we just saw that with USC and UCLA. What it does mean is that nothing is single factor analysis. There is no single solitary consideration that's just so crucial that it's the only thing that's coming into play. It's a confluence of factors that come together to drive the decisions for these presidents. And by the way, USC and UCLA are going to a superior academic conference in the Big Ten. You know who the Big Ten wants to add? Notre Dame. Yeah, they want their football. They want to, you know, embolden their uh, their media rights revenue and all that sort of stuff. Notre Dame, also a premier academic institution in the country. You know what a big research school is in the country? Michigan. You know another one? Ohio State. You know another one? Northwestern. Keep going down the list, right? If it were solely about athletics, then conferences would boot out certain schools. What has Northwestern ever done that's significant in football? I think they won a division title in the COVID season. whoop de doo they're, they're not making a dent there. So why is Northwestern in the Big Ten? Why doesn't the Big Ten kick out Northwestern Indiana and add USC, UCLA, and then Oregon and Washington? They have better sports because there are other factors at play here. So it's not the only factor, right? Considerations have to be weighed. If a school were to go to the Big 12, you do not have the potential academic funding and research opportunities that you would if you were in the Pac-12. But how much do you value that versus how much do you value having sufficient revenue for your athletic department? That's a question every president has to ask himself when weighing these sorts of decisions. But getting back to your question, Aaron, about where this stuff comes from, there are a variety of sources that make up a, a university's research funding budget. And basically, the, the reason that your conference affiliation matters is, look, the, these are, you know, universities. It's a very ivory tower, elitist kind of world, right? And it's very much, a, you know, cool kids club or knowing the right people or, you know, hanging out with, with the right sort of crowd. But the funding sources uh, it include, are not necessarily limited to, but these are the biggest ones as I understand it. Government grants, that's a big one with the, the federal government, the state government, and then within the federal government, different agencies will, will fund research as well that takes place at these big schools. So government grants is, a, is definitely a big one. Private companies fund research as well, nonprofit organizations, foundations, and then some of it, a small part of it, but some of it can come from other universities as well because it's a, you know, a collaborative effort. So the reason that there's more research money in certain conferences is because of the schools that you're affiliated with. So the Big 12 only has one AAU institution. They are not a premier academic conference. The SEC is a better academic conference than people probably give it credit for, than its reputation probably indicates, but it is above the Big 12. And so when you look at these conferences in the way that they you know, determine their membership and everything. Yeah, athletics are a part of it. Geography is a part of it. But they are also aligned as universities with regards to their institutional values and what they are, you know, what, what they are committed to as a university. So if it were only about athletics, again, that's why I bring this sort of stuff up because me personally, I don't care. I don't work in higher education. I work in college athletics. I talk about college athletics and whatnot. So that's the stuff that I truly, truly care about. But this stuff does matter to these schools, right? If it were just about athletics, you know who a top option to add for the Pac-12 would be? Boise State. You know who would get more consideration? Fresno State. But you know who doesn't? Those two schools. Because they do not pass the academic smell test for, for, for our beloved Conference of Champions here. So that's where the money comes from. And being affiliated with certain institutions gives you kind of more credibility, gives you more standing, right? And again, if you if you hear that and say, oh, that's just so elitist. Yes, 1,000%. One, 1, I'm not pushing back on that point in any way, shape, or form. But that is the reality on the ground. So if you're Utah, for instance, whose research funding has grown a lot over the years, if they had gone from the Mountain West to the Big 12, for instance, there is a high likelihood they would not be doing anywhere near as much research as they do now, which is about $686 million, if they had joined the Big 12. Which, by the way, 
does not have a school that on a research funding basis, they have some good schools over there. I'm not trying to dump on everybody in the Big 12. I'm just saying from a financial standpoint, it's not close when you compare it to the Pac-12. They don't have a school that in fiscal year 2022 did 600 million in research. The Pac-12 has four schools that did a billion. Cal, Stanford, Washington, Colorado. That's a gap. So I talk about this stuff because it matters to the university presidents and they drive realignment. So hopefully that's clear. If anything's not, shoot me a message as always. Uh, last thing to get to today. Stanford is not an easy football job. It, it is not. They don't play the NIL game very much. They, don't, they can't add kids via the portal. It's not easy. So you have to recruit at a high level if you're at Stanford from the high school ranks if you're going to compete going forward. You have to. You have to do it year in and year out. By the way, Stanford is capable of recruiting better than you probably think. They had a top 25 recruiting class just a couple of years ago under David Shaw when they were struggling. But what can they be going forward? I don't know if we know right now. I think time is going to tell. The instinct, I think, is to say mm, they're probably on the lower side of this, lo lower lower side of things there, from ta from a talent acquisition standpoint because they can't use the portal. But Troy Taylor, coming up from Sacramento State, is making some pretty tangible moves on that front. And that is noteworthy, and I wanted to talk about that here on the show. So they've landed three four-star players in the 2024 recruiting cycle, one of whom is uh, more, more notable than the others. But a couple of four-star edge prospects, Naki Tuakoi, apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, and Dylan Stevenson. Over the last three recruiting cycles, Stanford averaged three blue chip players per recruiting class, right? It was three four stars. They haven't landed a five star, I think, since uh, Davis Mills in the 2017 cycle. They already have three four star recruits in the 2024 class, and it's June. I'm not here saying Stanford is on track to take over the Pac-10 again. It would be great for the conference if they could get back to being great because they're in the Bay Area. They have a big brand. Those sorts of things are valuable to the Pac-12 going forward. If Stanford, you know, Oregon games or Stanford, Washington games or Stanford, Utah games were suddenly big again, I think that would be a net positive because they're in one of the most valuable media markets that the conference has left. But this is the sort these are the sorts of things it reminds me a lot of jed fish at arizona a couple of years ago right everything was wrong everything was bad everything was terrible and then you just started to see him land these sorts of players and one recruit oftentimes can kind of kickstart a run of increased momentum on that front for arizona it was tetaroa mcmillan a wide receiver who was really good as a true freshman will be a big player in their offense this year they beat out schools like oregon for Tetaroa McMillan. That wasn't supposed to happen when you're a 1 and 11 football team, when you'd lost 8 straight or 12 straight or whatever it was when Jed Fish, Jed Fish took over. Everything was a mess and then all of a sudden they went out and beat Oregon for T-Mac. That was a sign of good things to come. Well, Stanford landed those two four-star guys, but most notably, they landed Elijah Brown. Elijah Brown is the quarterback from Modern Day High School. You might have heard of it. It's in the Southern California area. They've produced some semi-notable quarterbacks who you might have heard of. One of them was named uh, Matt Leinert. He had a pretty good career. Uh, the other one, his name is Bryce Young. He was just taken pretty high in the NFL draft. I think he was a first-round pick to the Carolina Panthers. So Elijah Brown is the modern-day quarterback, and he just chose Stanford. 2024, he is the number three quarterback in the 24-7 sports composite, number eight on 24-7 overall. It depends on where you look. But regardless, this is a high four-star recruit at the most important position. He's a top 10 player at his position in the country, a top 10 quarterback in the country choosing Stanford. I'm just telling you to follow this. I'm just telling you to look and see where it goes. See what happens here. Because this is not the sort of thing that was regularly happening. It's not something you foresaw taking place as Stanford was having a miserable 2022 season. And yet here we are. Stanford, yes, that Stanford, who's just a punching bag for jokes, kick them while they're down and sort of stuff. They beat out USC, UCLA, 
This kid also had offers from Bama, Georgia, Washington, Utah, Tennessee, and Michigan. And he chose Stanford. I'm not saying the program was on the cusp of being turned around, but if you're going to have, this is a rebuild that has to be given time. And these are the sorts of players, these are the sorts of battles on the recruiting trail that you have to win at some point. That's a big time player for Stanford to land. And that is a big time piece of news if you're the Cardinal to already have three four stars in, in the next cycle. And Troy Taylor hasn't even coached a game on the field yet. What happens if Stanford starts pulling upsets this year? I'm not, I'm not predicting that's going to happen. I think they're going to be maybe one of the worst teams of the Pac-12. What if I am wrong? It's happened before. And they win some notable games. What if they go 5-7? and seven? Just saying. That's not the sort of kid any of you would have picked to go to Stanford. And here he is committing to the Cardinal. That is a big, big deal. If you're Troy Taylor, it's a big deal for the Cardinal, and it is something to watch in the Pac-12. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. Thanks for being patient for all you everydayers out there. Back in your feeds tomorrow, and until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.